Welcome to the program. That was a little introductory tease for the hour because a couple times a year I feel we need to consider one of the world's largest religions, that being Catholicism, not to present a program that is attacking, but rather exposing some issues in that faith that are aberrant and that are leading so many wonderful people astray. To do that, I will often turn to apologist Mike Gendron. I'm turning back to a recent book edited by Terry James because Mike Gendron has a chapter in this book, and we carry it, Trajectory Tracking the Approaching Tribulation Storm. Mike is just one of 17 contributors to this book that you can find in my store. The title of his chapter, which is indeed intriguing, is Religious End Times Tsunami. That's kind of what that introductory clip was about. We have a tsunami of denominations that are running to Rome. We're going to talk about that for a good part of the hour. And indeed, Catholicism has an aggressive agenda. It's to unite all faiths behind Rome. And to do that, many evangelicals must, and quite frankly, are going along with the Vatican agenda. So we're going to talk about that and much more this hour. Mike Gendron, welcome back to the program. Thank you, Jan. It's good to be back with you. Mike, I think for new listeners, maybe you should spend however long it takes to briefly share how you came to faith because you spent 35 years as a very devout Catholic. Yes, I was very devout, and that should give everyone hope as they try to reach their loved ones that are trapped in religious deception. I was an altar boy for seven years and taught high school Catholic Christian doctrine was really responsible for bringing the first Bible study to a Catholic church in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And it was during that time when I began reading the Bible that I had a crisis of faith because the plan of salvation that I was reading in the Bible was diametrically opposed to what I was taught as a Roman Catholic. And there's no more important issue in this life than settling the issue, where will I spend eternity? And so as I continued in this crisis of faith, it came down to this. Should I trust Christ and his word or the teachings and traditions of my religion? I knew I couldn't believe both. It was then that God granted me repentance. I turned from the false and fatal gospel of the Catholic Church and put my trust in Christ alone as my all-sufficient Savior, and my life has never been the same. Literally, my world was turned upside down. The first thing I realized is the only two things in this life that are eternal— are the souls of men and the Word of God, and I wanted to invest the rest of my life in reaching people for Christ. And I have a great love and compassion for Roman Catholics who are where I was, believing I was in the one true church, but yet on the wide road to destruction. So our ministry for 32 years now has been equipping the body of Christ to reach out to this huge mission field that's made up of 1.3 billion precious souls, and many of them are as deceived as I was, And yet the nature of deception is that people do not know they're deceived until they're confronted with the truth. And when I opened the Bible and began reading it, that's when God confronted me with the truth of his word. And so that's what we try to do. We try to confront Roman Catholics with the truth of God's word. I played an introductory clip there. The clip listed a staggering number of denominations that seem to be participating in an ecumenical effort uniting with Rome, certainly they're not calling out Rome as you might do, or even I might do, though I don't have a ministry to Catholics as you do, but I'm trying to contend for the faith here. How do you explain, particularly in the last 30, 40 years, how discernment seems to have been swept aside and all these denominations are willing to participate like this and join with Rome? The lack of discernment in the Christian church today is a consequence of people not getting a steady diet of God's truth from the pulpit. When people are not hearing the truth, they cannot discern what is false, and there is a lack of discernment. Many Christians today don't know what the true gospel is. They could not identify a false gospel. On top of that, you have many of our evangelical leaders that are signing unity accords with the Roman Catholic religion, daring to say that we share a common faith in the same gospel. And that statement is utterly false, and yet so many people are being influenced by our evangelical leaders. You have apprised me again of the Manhattan Declaration, and this is not a program on the Manhattan Declaration, but I think it's important. It came about in 2009, and there are now 650,000 signatures, some very prominent Christian leaders. If you choose to name them, that's fine, because 
I'm not keenly familiar with this declaration, other than I know it's a unity accord, and I know lots of them have signed who shouldn't have signed. Please help my audience understand what this is. Some of these people I know personally, and I pleaded with them to remove their names from the Manhattan Declaration because of their influence. People like Ravi Zacharias and Al Mohler and J.I. Packer, Johnny Erickson Tata, Randy Alcorn, Kay Author, Mark Bailey, Gary Bauer, James Dobson, Richard Land, Josh McDowell. And these are highly visible, highly influential evangelicals. I've told them that they are confusing Christians by uniting with the Catholic Church and its false gospel. Unfortunately, many evangelicals are confused. They don't know if the Catholic Church represents a huge mission field that needs to be evangelized or if it's a Christian denomination made up of brothers and sisters in Christ. And so the truth needs to be told that we cannot have unity with the Roman Catholic religion. It is a mission field. So the Manhattan Declaration, then, is clearly promoting unity. It is. It's calling for Catholics, Orthodox, and Evangelicals to be co-belligerents to fight the social and moral wars. If theology was left out of the Manhattan Declaration, then it would be a good thing to join hands to fight the social wars. When you introduce the gospel in the accord, then it should not be signed by Evangelicals. Then we've got the Tony Palmers, and folks, I've played this clip before. Not sure it can be played too often, because in this clip, Palmer, he happens to be ministering at a Kenneth Copeland rally, I believe, in Texas. And he's saying here, diversity is divine. He's saying, because Catholic means universal, we should join the universal church. We should all be Catholics. You have to hear this to really believe it. He's going to close by saying a terrible untruth. Folks, when I had a conference speaker back in 2005 who got up and said things that weren't true, I went up on the platform and I stopped him and I asked him to sit down. I wish Kenneth Copeland would have done this to Tony Palmer because here is what he says. We know that the first thousand years there was one church. It was called the Catholic Church. And the word Catholic means universal. It doesn't mean Roman. Catholic means if you're born again, raise your hand if you're born again. You're a Catholic. We are Catholics. And then there was the split at the end of the first millennium. We had the Orthodox, East and West, two churches. Then 500 years later, we have Luther and his protest, three churches in 1,500 years. And then from Luther's protest onwards, 33,000 new denominations. I've come to understand that diversity is divine. It's division that's diabolic. It's the glory. If you accept that Christ is living in me and the presence of God is in me and the presence of God is in you, that's all we need. Because God will sort out all our doctrines when we get upstairs. Now, why is it historic? Because in 1999, the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant Lutheran Church signed an agreement that brought an end to the protest. Luther believed that we were saved by grace through faith alone. Amen. But that's not it. The Catholic Church believed that we were saved by works. And that was the protest. In 1999, they wrote this together. This brought an end to the protest of Luther. Brothers and sisters, Luther's protest is over, is yours. So the protest has been over for 15 years. And I get a bit cheeky here because I challenge my Protestant pastor friends. If there is no more protest, how can there be a Protestant church? Maybe we now we're all Catholics again. But we are reformed. We are Catholic in the universal sense. We are not protesting the doctrine of salvation by the Catholic Church anymore. We now preach the same gospel. Mike Gendron, tell me what's wrong with what we just heard, because I find it outrageous. It is outrageous, and that unity accord between Lutherans and Catholics in 1999 was a horrible mistake. It dared to say that we are justified by faith plus works. 
The Roman Catholic Church is never the one to compromise. It's always the evangelicals and the Protestants. The Roman Catholic Church dares to say in the Council of Trent that if you believe that you are justified by faith alone, then you are anathema. And yet that is the gospel. We are justified by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, according to Scripture alone. The Roman Catholic Church condemns those who believe that. So there cannot be unity. Palmer doesn't know what the true church is. The true church is those who are called out of the world, a people for God's own possession. They've been sanctified by the truth. They have repented and believed the one and only gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the body of Christ. The only way to enter the body of Christ is to be born again of the Spirit of God. But the Catholic Church says in order to become a member of the Catholic Church, you have to be baptized by water. So there's major differences between the Roman Catholic Church and the Church of Jesus Christ. That's one of the things I was reacting to in that clip. He says, we preach the same gospel, which is a terrible misstatement. I know he knows what he's saying. And again, why didn't somebody in that auditorium stand up and challenge him? Did that go through your mind too? Well, sure. We need more courageous people like the Reformers. Martin Luther, for example, stood alone before the Roman Emperor and the Pope, and he would not compromise. He said, I stand on the word of God and he would not reject anything that he said according to the Word of God. I'm basing some of our discussion on the chapter Mike Gendron has written in the Terry James book, Trajectory, Tracking the Approaching Tribulation Storm. You can find that in my online store, olivetreeviews.org, olivetreeviews.org. You can call my office. You can get on our newsletter lists where we often promote these items. You are listening to Understanding the Times Radio. I'm Jan Markell. On the line from Texas is Mike Gendron. Mike, I'm not quite leaving the issue of evangelicals endorsing the doctrine of Rome, and we're going to get to some issues as it concerns Catholicism in Bible prophecy here. We'll do that in just a few minutes. But I was on your website, which is proclaimingthegospel.org, proclaimingthegospel.org, And I came across a short video that I want you to talk about. Let me set the stage by saying the video seems to be presenting some folks, I can even name them, who are, in one case, I believe it might be Lou Engel, who is bowing down and kissing the feet of a priest. Am I right there? That's correct. And standing alongside and looking rather approvingly, I see Mike Bickle from House of Prayer in Kansas City. I see Cindy Jacobs. I see Che Ahn looking extremely approvingly. Just describe what I'm talking about. Then I'm going to play the clip. But again, my radio audience, you will not be able to see exactly what we're talking about. That's why we make a video version of the program. Watch the video version at my website, olivetreeviews.org, and go to radio. Or you can watch it on our Rumble channel, YouTube channel, and we're not being censored. And you can watch it on his channel, Christian Television. Mike, tell my audience what this is about, then I'm going to play the clip. It's a perfect example of how successful the Pope has been in uniting evangelicals together with Roman Catholics. It's the ecumenical movement. You can see it with your own eyes in this video clip. It doesn't matter if you are an evangelical or a Protestant. If you are joining hands with the Roman Catholic Church, you are compromising the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. There is only one gospel, and that is so clearly stated in 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. Paul says, I make known to you, brethren, the gospel, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and he was buried, and he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. One person, two events. That's the gospel of Christ, and yet the Roman Catholic religion teaches a gospel of works righteousness. You have to be baptized. You have to receive the sacraments. You have to do good works. You have to obey the law. You have to believe a place called purgatory will purge away your sins, thus denying the efficacy of Christ's blood. And you have to participate in the sacrifice of the Mass, which is a representation of Jesus in the form of the Eucharist as a propitiatory sacrifice. So these evangelicals and Protestants that are joining hands with the Catholic Church are joining hands with this false gospel. There needs to be a movement to contend earnestly for the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints, because there are many gullible people that are jumping on the ecumenical bandwagon, carrying out the Pope's agenda 
to unite the world under the power and influence of the papacy. And we're going to play this clip, and again, my radio audience, we have Lou Engel literally bowing down to a Catholic priest. Well, the Reformation can never be reversed because there is a wide chasm that separates us on the essentials of the gospel, on how one is born again, on how one is justified, on how one is purified of sin. We are separated on who can mediate between God and man, and we are distinctly separated on the efficacy, the sufficiency, and the necessity of Jesus Christ. There can never be unity with Rome. We must stand on the truth and be sanctified by the truth. You know what we're lacking according to Rome? We don't have the Eucharist, the body and blood, soul and divinity of Christ. And each time a Roman Catholic priest offers that for the fullness of salvation, I will tell him, in Christ, I already have the complete forgiveness of sin. And according to your catechism, you don't. In Christ, I have the assurance of eternal life based on his promises and his power. And according to your catechism, you don't. In Christ, I have the power to live a victorious life in Christ Jesus, and you don't. Why don't you leave your religion and come to Christ? Then you too can enjoy every spiritual blessing in him. Did you know that the Bible was placed on the list of forbidden books at the Council of Trent? You can see that today. Pick up a copy of the Council of Trent. Why would they place the Bible on the list of forbidden books? Because of John 8, 31 and 32, where Jesus said, if you're truly a disciple of mine, you will abide in my word. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You see, the Bible was setting all these Roman Catholics free from religious indoctrination, free to stand up and follow Christ. I am going to the chapter that Mike has written. This, again, is in the trajectory book, and he titles this segment of his article, The Coming Religious Tsunami, says the precursor to these events is now taking place throughout the world. Satan's plan will include what will look like a global religious tsunami that will bring about the convergence of apostate Christianity with all the world's non-Christian religions. The demonic deception will be so powerfully effective that it will deceive even the elect if possible. The Lord Jesus warned us deception would be one of the visible signs that will precede his second coming and will help create a global religious system that will give its allegiance and worship to the Antichrist. And that's where we're heading in a few minutes here, folks. And then he says, the satanic kingdom will encompass all the nations of the world. It will be Satan's final attempt to be worshipped as the most high God and to receive the glory he has desired from the beginning. He concludes this paragraph, Satan's political leader will join hands with his spiritual leader who will seduce the world with the promise of peace and prosperity. The false prophet causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the false Christ, Revelation thirteen twelve. And where I want to go here in the next few minutes, Mike, and I can perhaps set the stage by simply asking you this question right now, though we may pick up on it more in part two of my programming, but that is, I think you strongly do believe that a pope, perhaps Francis, perhaps his successor, will in fact be the false prophet of Revelation? Yes, I do. I know that goes against the reformers who thought the Pope would be the Antichrist. But I think if you look at the world situation today, if we are in the season of the Lord's return, there is no more influential false prophet in the world today than Pope Francis. If we are in the season of the Lord's return, then I believe he would point the world to the Antichrist. Most people think, how would anybody worship a false Christ? And yet the Roman Catholic Church does that every Sunday when the Eucharist is lifted up, and they believe that is the physical body and blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. It is a false Christ that is being worshipped by Catholics today. And as you heard earlier in my clip, this is the calling card of the Roman Catholic religion. They are telling Protestants that you cannot have the fullness of salvation until you come back home to Rome for the Eucharist. That is the false Christ that is being worshipped today. So Catholicism does not believe Christ will return until the whole world is Catholic. Am I right there? That's correct. He will not return bodily until Mm -hmm. the whole world is Roman Catholic. That's their eschatology. They're all millennial. They don't believe in a thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth. 
first the world has to become Roman Catholic or united in this global religion that the Pope is trying to form. How might they go about converting the world? First of all, that's an overwhelming task to try to convert 8 billion people. You've got animists and Hindus, and even Jews, who are likely not going to convert to anything, at least until the Antichrist. When the Antichrist comes along, that's a whole nother dispensation, and it's a whole nother story. But how do you think they're thinking, the Catholic Church? The Bible says that lying signs and wonders will bring unity we have apparitions of Mary appearing more and more frequently throughout the world. And these apparitions claiming to be Mary are saying that she's coming for all of her children. She is appearing to places like Fatima, a city named after Muhammad's first daughter. Muslims are now flocking to Fatima to get a revelation and a message from Mary. So I believe that Satan will use these apparitions to unite the world. If Roman Catholicism were to unite with Islam, and there are 10 common bonds that they both have, the rest of the religions of the world will join suit. Because when you have 1.3 billion Catholics and 1.6 billion Muslims coming together, that represents 40% of the world's population. Keep in mind, the Church of Jesus Christ will be raptured to heaven, and so the only ones left on the earth are false Christians and non-Christian religions, so these apparitions will easily deceive the rest of the world. In part two of my programming, we're going to head to some of those apparitions. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it, and we actually have covered that on this program two or three times, but I feel it's so important to understand some of the lying signs and wonders that are going on on Earth today because that is the specialty of Satan, and it will also become the specialty of the Antichrist. But one of the things that has been used certainly the last 40 years would be the apparitions, so we'll probably open part two of my programming talking about the apparitions of Mary. Mike, you are blunt about that. These are simply lying signs and wonders, am I right? That's what the Lord Jesus said. We stand under good authority when Jesus said this would be the signs of the end time. He said the deception would be so great that even the elect could be deceived if possible. And we know he doesn't mean deception about the gospel, but deception about these other lying signs and wonders that would unite the world. We're seeing globalism everywhere. The Pope is not only trying to unite all the religions, he's also trying to unite all the governments. A lot of people don't realize that he's a head of state. The Vatican City is a sovereign nation, and ambassadors from countries all over the world come to visit the Pope and talk about globalism. I think I read it either in your chapter or else on your website that it's not just evangelicals who are running to Rome. It's also U.S. presidents. Since 1959, every U.S. president has visited Rome and the Vatican and the Pope. Am I right? That's how powerful of a man he is, mm -hmm. not only religiously, but also in the global government picture. That is amazing. I know when he addresses Congress or whenever he's in America, it seems like the whole nation stops and every news outlet focuses on this endlessly. And I think what we need to do also in part two of my programming is just go over some of the things that Pope Francis does believe, because it's quite shocking. He is a Jesuit pope. Folks, what does that mean? Jesuits are the secret police of the papacy. So is it important that we don't know how long Pope Francis is going to be in office? He could step down. He could even pass away. He's becoming quite aged. So all of this could change in the coming weeks. But just what is the Jesuit agenda? We'll talk about that. We're going to go to the apparitions of Mary when I get back. We're going to talk about where does all of this fit in Bible prophecy. We're going to hit that. All of those items in part two of today's programming. Don't go away, please. I'm back in just a couple of minutes. The paranormal and the supernatural realm. How should the average person react to claims of apparitions visiting Earth? They're unexplainable, yet millions of believers lend credence to the possibility that something is happening. Recent appearances of Mary have been reported in nearly every habitable nation. Are these events legitimate? Is God sending us a message? However you answer, one thing is certain. The apparitions of the Blessed Virgin Mary draw millions to every corner of the globe. Around the world, reports of supernatural events are drawing millions to apparition sites where the Virgin Mary is said to be appearing. 
thousands of visionaries from every conceivable background describe a beautiful young woman glowing in radiant splendor. Her hair is going up. Yeah, she's beautiful. She's real big. Yeah, she's big. She's just standing there. It just paralyzed us. It was so impressive. She emanated an incredible light. It was as if I had entered into another world. There was such silence. She appears as a living, breathing, three-dimensional lady, enveloped in exquisite light. Sears, when describing her, admit that the Queen of Heaven transcends human description. Millions flock to apparition sites, hoping to encounter the Blessed Virgin Mary. Consider that 15 to 20 million Marian followers visit a single shrine in Guadalupe, Mexico every single year. The shrine is dedicated to Our Lady of Guadalupe, who appeared in 1531 to Seer Juan Diego. Many of the pilgrims claim miracles are still occurring in Guadalupe today, the result of Mary's continued presence. In war-torn Bosnia, an estimated 30 million pilgrims have visited Majugori since the apparitions of the Blessed Virgin Mary began in 1981. Besides the six visionaries who regularly receive messages from the Virgin, thousands of pilgrims claim to see signs and wonders experience healing, and hear the voice of Mary at Majugori. In Conyers, Georgia, seer Nancy Fowler has received up to 100,000 visitors to her farm on a single day. The pilgrims come from all over, many traveling great distances to hear the Virgin's most recent message. Do I ask of you? Yes, to trust me. Tell my children, I am alive. Many followers believe the Blessed Mother is present. Currently, she is appearing all over the world, hundreds of times. There, there are many visionaries. Nancy is one of the links. And uh, the time is running out, and Our Lady said that she is stopping in everywhere. Definitely believe something's going on. And for all those who believe, they may now have the proof they need to convince others. Two scientists from Columbia came to the farm yesterday to study Fowler, and they say she is definitely seeing something when she goes into her trances. It has a brain activity that looks and seems to be like coma, but she is awake and fully responsive. Conyers, Georgia, is not unique. Apparitions from almost every state in America are being reported. From New York to California, visitations from a supernatural lady identifying herself as Mary, the mother of Jesus, have been documented. Nor is this phenomenon unique to America. She is appearing everywhere. Welcome back. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. Jan Markell here talking to apologist Mike Gendron for the hour because he has a chapter in the Terry James book, Trajectory, Tracking the Approaching Tribulation Storm. Mike has written in his chapter heavily about his unique specialty, and that would be Roman Catholicism. We're heading to where it might fit in Bible prophecy here in just a moment or two. And obviously, that was actually a clip from the Jim Tetlow film, Messages from Heaven. You can find that on YouTube. It's about 20 years old now talking about millions of people going to Medjugorje and other places now in the last 20 years, many millions more. What are they seeing? It says in 2 Thessalonians 2 that people are going to see and experience and believe lying signs and wonders, tragically. That's what these people are experiencing. They don't know it. I actually have talked to Catholics who do not accept that because they saw the sun skipping, and they saw Mary was somewhere in the rays of the sunlight in the clouds. Just real quickly, we are so pleased to announce that Olive Tree now has our own app. It is available in the App Store for Apple devices and the Play Store for Android devices. We're getting such astoundingly good reports on the app. You can search for Olive Tree Ministries in these locations and look for our logo, the star and the dove, and the app will provide easy access to our radio programs, including the video version. 
It'll live stream our bi-monthly events. You can read our news headlines. You can go straight to our social media channels. And you won't get hung up with the wrong YouTube channel again because we've got about 500 stolen videos on YouTube. So if you're on YouTube, look for over 186,000 subscribers. That is our actual YouTube channel. Or use the app. Okay, Mike, I want to go several places with the time we have left. I played that clip of the apparitions. Let's comment on that. Then I want to have you talk a little bit more specifically about Pope Francis himself. You claim he is a Marxist. He's obviously a globalist. But we just heard a clip where we've heard these wonderful Catholic people. They're seeing something, and it's quite haunting. Talk to us about it. My heart goes out to them because Satan is the master deceiver. And in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, we read that Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. And in 1 John 4, 1, we are called to test the spirits. And how do we do that? Well, we test the spirits with the authority of God's inspired word. And we listen to the messages. Mary is saying she's coming for all of her children She's saying that you can be saved apart from her son, Jesus, as long as you do good works. Well, that is the common bond of all false religions is a works righteousness salvation. And so it tickles the ears of those who do not know the Savior, who do not know the truth of God's word. Many people are being deceived. I have a graph of all the apparitions that have been appearing. The graph is exponential. I believe Satan knows his days are numbered. He's got an all-out attack against the truth, and he's really out to deceive the world. So we're seeing more and more apparitions appearing in more and more places throughout the world. It is a very effective weapon that Satan is using to deceive people, turning their attention away from Christ and putting it on Mary. Jan, I'm sure you know that the Catholic Church believes that Mary is a sinless mediator. Many Catholic women prefer to go through Mary as their mediator between them and God than Christ. And we know there's only one mediator, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. According to the film, which I've seen in its entirety, Messages from Heaven, true healings are happening at these appearances. How do we explain that? Satan has the power to bring healing. He cannot raise anyone from the dead, but he has great power, and he operates under the sovereign rule of Almighty God. His goal is to deceive the world, and he uses different instruments to do that, including healing people. I find it stunning because we have in the film seers, literally in every country of the world, who are witnessing the supposed apparitions of Mary. And again, folks are seeing something. What do you suppose they are seeing? They're seeing Satan appearing as an angel of light. And it's really interesting when you look at the history of the apparitions, if this was truly a message from God, why would God talk to three little children at Fatima? Why wouldn't he go to the Pope with his message? Could it be because children are easily deceived and they don't know what to expect? There's a lot of questions that we need to be asking when people are so easily deceived by these lying signs and wonders. Yeah. Tens and tens of millions of people are seeing something. I have acquaintances here in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. This would have been some 20 years ago but they were convinced that what they were seeing was legitimate. Mike, I want to look at Pope Francis for a few minutes here. And again, we don't know how long he's even going to be in office. You said something interesting before we were getting into the programming today about Pope Benedict, because he recently passed away. You were commenting about how the media was tied into Pope Benedict. Why don't you expound on that for a minute or two? Because that happened here in the last year, and I think it was a significant news event people are trying to better understand. Last month at Pope Benedict's funeral, all the eyes of the world were focused on St. Peter's Basilica. That's the very church that was financed by the selling of God's forgiveness through indulgences. We saw Catholic cardinals and bishops masqueraded as ministers of righteousness in their purple and scarlet robes. Colors, by the way, which are describing the woman that rides the beast in Revelation 17. But the pageantry of their pagan traditions and the grandeur of their corrupt religion bewitched gullible people into believing that this is what Christianity is all about. And the global media was the Pope's willing partner in spreading his distorted gospel along with his aggressive agenda to unite all Christians under the papacy. It was really a great commercial 
for the Roman Catholic religion because there is a lot of pomp and pageantry when one of the popes dies. And it's really a great opportunity for the pope and the Roman Catholic religion to attract the world. Pope Francis just recently said that to evangelize is a pagan tradition. And so he's obviously got the spirit of Antichrist because it was the Lord Jesus who gave us the great commission to go and evangelize the world. But the Pope is saying, instead of evangelizing, we just need to show the attractiveness of the Roman Catholic religion and let people come because we're so attractive. This is what you saw when Pope Benedict had his funeral, the attraction of all the eyes focused on St. Peter's and the pomp and pageantry. I asked you a question off air, and that is, why would these cardinals select a man like Pope Francis? He's a known Marxist. He's a known globalist. He has made some outrageous statements. There's no hell. He would baptize a Martian. Help us understand the hierarchy that would not only allow this, but actually want this type of a person to lead over a billion Catholics. You have to realize that Pope Benedict was a doctrinal guru. He was not a pastor in heart. He wrote the Catechism of the Catholic Church. I think when they were looking for a successor to Pope Benedict, they wanted to go to the other extreme and find a pastoral pope. And they selected Pope Francis. Remember when he was first elected, everybody was admiring how humble he was, that he didn't want to stay in the pope's quarters, but he wanted to rent a room there on the Vatican. He won a lot of people over early on, but I don't know how many of the cardinals were excited about him being a universalist because what's really developed in his eight years of being the Pope is a lot of anti-Catholic teaching. He's gone against historic Roman Catholicism. He's a universalist. He said, and I quote, the Lord has redeemed all of us with the blood of Christ, all of us not just Catholics, everyone, even the atheist, everyone. The blood of Christ has redeemed us all. You've got a Pope that is not only a universalist, but this is tickling the ears of the rest of the world. Why not come to Rome and we can all be saved because the Pope's saying that everyone is a child of God. And once again, it proved that he didn't know his Bible because everybody in this world, according to Jesus, is either a child of God or a child of the devil. He said that when he was rebuking the apostate religious leaders in John chapter 8, he said, your father is the devil. We've got a pope that's a universalist. He's gathering all people in unity. He says all religions will be joined together, and the common bond will be a works righteousness salvation. And Jan, I'm sure your listeners know that Biblical Christianity is set apart from all the religions of the world. We know that we are saved by grace because our trust is in the all-sufficient Savior. But all the other religions teach that you must do things to appease their God. And so this will be the common bond that unites all the religions under the power and influence of the papacy. You also stated that Pope Francis denies the existence of hell. I have the direct quote. He said, there is no hell where sinners suffer in eternity. He declared, hell does not exist, but what does exist is the disappearance of sinful souls. I think he's alluding to or implying that there's annihilation. You can see how he contradicts himself. In the one statement, he says, everyone will be in heaven, universal salvation. But then he says, some that do not make it will no longer exist. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio, Jan Markell, talking to Mike Gendron. You can learn more, actually, an awful lot on his website, proclaimingthegospel.org. Mike, you have some tools there or some tracks you're offering. Help us understand what you have to offer there. We have eight different gospel tracks, and part of the Great Commission is to go and make disciples, teaching everyone to observe everything Christ has commanded. So our gospel tracks are scripturally accurate. After we give the gospel verbally, we can leave a gospel track behind so that people can look at the scriptures, go to their Bible, and test the teachings of the track. We have the inspired Word of God, and we need to test the uninspired words of men with the inspired Word of God. That needs to be our supreme authority. So all of our resources are based on that principle. 
I never want people to believe what I believe. I want them to believe the Word of God. And so I've written a book called Preparing for Eternity, and it's really something we all need to be doing because one day we will meet our Creator and we will stand right before Him. He'll either be a merciful Savior or a sin-avenging judge, but one day we will all stand before Him. It's important to prepare for eternity now. And then the other book that I've written most recently is Contending for the Gospel. And this program has been about the ecumenical movement and how the Catholic Church is trying to gather all people together. We need to contend for the gospel. We cannot compromise it. We need to stand on the truth of God's Word. And so this book would really equip people to do the work of an evangelist as an ambassador for Christ and contend for the one and only gospel of grace. Folks, for those books, you have to go through proclaimingthegospel.org. Olive Tree, at this point, is not carrying them, and the other items Mike's referencing, find them at proclaimingthegospel.org. Mike, let's help people understand, in that we're running a little bit short of time, the concept of a Jesuit pope. You and I actually have talked about this before, and I just think folks need to understand that Jesuits went to war against those who came against the Catholic Church at one time. Jesuits, I don't think they're nice people. Am I wrong? I don't think I'm wrong. No, they're very militant. In yeah. fact, they were formed at the Counter-Reformation in the 16th century, and their agenda was to protect the Pope and to eliminate all opposition to the Roman Catholic religion. You saw a lot of Protestants being burned at the stake and put to death. So anyone that came against the Catholic Church... It was the Jesuits' responsibility to eliminate them. Now, 500 and some years later, we have a Jesuit pope for the first time. And it's really interesting to see the agenda that he has. It's the most aggressive agenda to unite the world politically, economically, and also spiritually. I am amazed at how many people are so gullible and that they will travel so far to meet with him and carry out his agenda to unite the world together. We really are living in the last days, and more than ever, we need to be about the Lord's business. If you have loved ones that you want to see saved, we need to be about sharing the gospel with them, because God doesn't promise anyone tomorrow. Jan, I know that your programs have sensed the times in which we live are the very end of the end times, and we really need to be reaching people with a sense of urgency because we do not know what tomorrow brings. Speaking of the end times, I have to ask the question, somehow does the Vatican fit into the whole concept found in Revelation 17? Is it the woman riding the beast? I will play one more clip here, and this would be Mike talking to Nathan Jones and Tim Moore about where does the Catholic Church fit before and after. We've talked about before here for almost an hour but they're going to play a role after the rapture as well. Well, that brings up the question then is, where is this going in the field of eschatology? Or yes. the Bible say, where do you see the Catholic Church role before the rapture and after the rapture? Well, a lot of people are unaware, but Roman Catholicism does have an eschatology. And you can actually search this uh, through the web, but they believe that there will be a Roman Catholic Pope who will unite with a Roman Catholic monarch who together will establish a time of peace and prosperity on the earth. And so we look at the papacy as being the false prophet. We see from the book of Revelation there will be a false prophet. Not the Antichrist, because I think what for centuries people believed the Antichrist would be the Pope. Yes, you the, think reformers, he's more the, false the reformers prophet? believe the Pope was the Antichrist. But I, okay. having studied Revelation, I see a false prophet. The Pope is the most influential false prophet in the world today. Um, Roman Catholics have been indoctrinated to believe that anybody who sits on the papal throne is holy, and when he sits on the chair of Peter, he is infallible. So here you have a false prophet said to be infallible when it comes to faith and morals, and so he will be influential in uniting the world because people esteem him as a leader who cannot lie or deceive people. And, and let's be clear, when we use the word false prophet, we don't throw that around casually. The, mm -hmm. the Bible says that anyone who makes a, a prediction of what will happen as a revelation from God, and it does not occur, is a false prophet. And anyone who steers the faithful away from the true doctrines 
that are revealed in Scripture is a false prophet. So we're not just throwing around that charge uh, haphazardly, and it's not us that is making that accusation. It's the Scripture that points out who we should avoid and the falsehoods that we should flee from, quite frankly. And that's what your ministry is all about. So as opposed to that eschatology, contrast that with what we reveal, what Scripture reveals as the true uh, end times plan that God has put into place and has foretold. Well, we look to be looking at the um, rapture as the next event that will take place. Hallelujah, yes. Yes, and when all the sanctified believers are taken to heaven, the, the only people left are professing Christians, Roman Catholics, and people of world religions. And they're all going to be religions that focus on a works righteousness salvation. That will be the glue that unites all the religions of the world. And when you have a pope that says all people are children of God, that there is no hell, that even atheists will make it to heaven, this is what the world wants to hear. Mm -hmm. And so this will be the agenda of either Pope Francis, or we don't know the Lord's timing, but whoever the Pope may be. There's a third role in the tribulation. We read about, the, of course, the Antichrist and the false prophet, but there appears to be a mystery Babylon religion, a ecumenical religion that takes hold at the first half of the tribulation, and the ten kings and the Antichrist hate it and end up killing it. Could the Pope not is an alternative, not be the false prophet who leads a, basically Satan worship in the second half, but be the head of that ecumenical religion that will be destroyed midway through the tribulation? Well, we do know that um, the Catholic Church is worshiping a false Christ today. In fact, I brought with me a, a Eucharist. The Catholic Church believes that the priest and all the clergy have the power to call the Lord Jesus Christ down from heaven and through the miracle of transubstantiation change the inner substance into the physical body and blood, soul, and divinity. The priest and the Pope lifts this up and says, this is the body of Christ, and all the Catholic faithful say yes. So they are worshiping a false Christ. And I'm saying this by the authority of Scripture because Jesus even said, if anyone says here is the Christ, do not believe them. We know that Jesus will remain in heaven until all of his enemies have been made his footstool. We know that according to Hebrews 9.28, he will appear a second time and not in relation to sin. And so this cannot be Christ by the authority of Scripture because the Catholic Jesus returns every day to the earth. So it's so easy to see how the world is going to worship a false Christ when you have 1.2 billion Catholics worshiping a false Christ today. Okay, Mike, and I'm really almost out of time, but if you'd like to comment on that, again, this woman riding the beast, is this Catholicism? It fits Catholicism like a hand in glove. The woman's adornment is with gold, yep. jewels, and pearls. It's a picture of great wealth, and the Catholic Church may be the richest institution on the face of the earth. We also see the harlot is adorned with the same colors that are worn by the Roman Catholic clergy. Catholic bishops wear purple robes and Catholic cardinals wear scarlet robes. The harlot has in her hand a cup full of abominations, a golden cup. And I believe the greatest abomination that could fill the cup is the counterfeit blood of Jesus. Catholic priests have been deluding people with the power to change wine into a golden chalice into the blood of Christ. To me, there's no greater abomination than that. The gold cup or chalice may be seen at every Roman Catholic communion service. It is a vile and detestable cup of abominations that is worshipped by Roman Catholic priests. And it's just as heartbreaking for me as a former Catholic to see so many Catholics today worship a Eucharist as the true Christ, and according to Scripture, it cannot be him. It's no different from the Israelites worshiping the golden calf as the true God that delivered them out of Egypt. God called it idolatry, and he had 3,000 put to death. We also see the woman is drunk with the blood of the saints, and if you look throughout history, it reveals the persecution of the Catholic Church of over 50 million Christians, far more people than any other religion. Pope Innocent III murdered more Christians in one afternoon than any Roman emperor did in his entire reign. On August 24th, St. Bartholomew Day Massacre in France, approximately 100,000 Protestants were murdered by orders of the Pope and blood flowed through the streets of Paris ankle deep. You know what the reward was for those who put to death these Christians? The Pope offered them plenary indulgences for murdering the French Huguenots. Mm -hmm. 
So this is the history of the Roman Catholic Church. She is drunk with the blood of the saints. Okay. Learn more at ProclaimingTheGospel.org. You can communicate with Mike there as well. I base some of my interview, anyway, on the Terry James book, Trajectory, Tracking the Approaching Tribulation Storm. Find that at olivetreeviews.org. Call my office, get on our newsletter list. It'll be promoted in... I'm not afraid.